was fun. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I know there's all the empty seats that have suddenly appeared since you, Lori, got <laughs> went away. I know, I got you. Well, you know what? We're all the cool kids in here, aren't we? <laughs> so, uh, I am uh, having, I, I gotta tell you, I've said this a couple times, I wanna thank you all for coming. Uh, this is my chance to recharge my batteries. This is my chance. This, the, the, it's hard these days, folks. It's hard. Um, and we're fighting a battle that's kind of new. Uh, you know, we, I, I've been in this movement for 21 years, 22 years, I guess. And um, I, that includes the George W. Bush era. And, you know, we thought that was hard. <laughs> Remember when we thought George W. Bush was hard? Yeah, that's not so hard anymore. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been a real challenge. It's, it's, so, it, it's difficult these days to be an atheist activist, and a lot of you atheist activists know that. And uh, I relish this opportunity to see you all and get back to where I was, because you know, the first thing that I did as an atheist activist was attend these conventions and be with you all and, and, and have the experience. Um, now, I've already done this once, but I'm gonna do it again uh, because it's so important to me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and look around, and if you are in the overflow room, uh, please do this as well. Raise your hand if it's your first time. Okay, everybody look around. Look at that. Look at that. Now, I hope you all, thank you, I hope you all are wearing first-timer pins. Uh, because uh, we want you to feel included, we want you to feel uh, aware, we're really, really happy that you're here. Uh, to those of you who are about to raise your hand, please find these first timers and, uh, and, and socialize with them. Bring them into your tables, bring them in. Let's, let's do the other side. Raise your hand if you've been with this, if, with this movement for more than five years, for more than 10 years, for more than 20 years. For more than 30 years. Yeah, just a few, yeah. This community is vibrant, this community is beautiful, and this community is mature. And this community uh, is filled with, um, with the most wonderful people that I've ever known. I came to this movement, like I said before, because of the, because of the uh, issues, but I stayed because of the people. And I hope that you all old timers uh, like Dennis uh, would uh, welcome in people who are new and bring them in and, and take them around and show them around and make them feel welcome. Uh, we are a beautiful, wonderful community and uh, I hope all you first timers fall in love with this community as I did when I first fell in love, when I first came around. Now the title of this talk is How the Mighty, have get, how the Mighty Get Back Up. The reason that I picked this topic is that some time ago, I was in a rather low point in my life. I was at a low point financially, I was at a low point emotionally, I was even at a low point physically. And somebody asked me what I was going to do about it. And I didn't know the answer. Uh, it was tough, and I didn't know the answer. And I said, you know how the, that you know how you know that the mighty have fallen because the mighty get back up. And that is something that, yeah, you know what? I think it's a beautiful statement. And we feel fallen right now, if I can. I mean, Mandisa was up here a few, uh, about an hour ago. Uh, by the way, I don't know where Mandisa is, but if Mandisa's in the audience, thank you, Mandisa. That was a great talk. And she is dedicating uh, her life, the rest of her life or her career to this movement um, because uh, it's, important and it's necessary. And so many people think, uh, like she said, that the, might, that, the, that the movement is dead or dying or sick. And you know they didn't expect an 850 person atheist convention to even exist anymore. So thank you all for coming. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, take some time to talk about how we're going to get back up, what exactly it takes to get back up, how, we're, how this is happening. So uh, failure is not falling down, but refusing to get back up. 
American Atheist was forged in the heat of battle. Madeleine O'Hare was a fighter. She started much lower than we are right now. And she created, essentially she created this movement. Essentially she made the atheist movement what it is today. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what is happening now and how it's getting back. Now when we're talking about what is happening, we're looking at the second classing of atheists. The second classing of atheists. We are second class citizens and we're becoming more and more so every day. Religious rights are becoming, are getting more and more priority over civil rights. And corporations, they have religious beliefs too. And if, if corporations have bel religious beliefs and religious beliefs are over civil rights, corporate religious beliefs are superseding civil rights today. And students are suffering from this too. We have a school voucher system that is creating a second class of students. This is happening today. And it feels bad, ladies and gentlemen. It feels bad and it's having an effect on our movement. It is affecting the atheist community. We are feeling the pinch. We are feeling the hurt. And so the question is, after we figure out what, how we feel, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to get back up? How are we going to resist? How are we going to recover? Can we recover? Yes, by the way. Yes, we can recover, we will recover, we are already recovering. In fact, we are seeing the beginnings of the recovery now. An American atheist is building a caring community to start it off with. A pro-heart, pro-brain, anti-asshole community here at American Atheists. So, I swear sometimes, uh, so if you're offended by swearing, that's uh, it's going to be a rough presentation for you. Uh, after we establish this community that we have, this anti-asshole community, we have to have a plan. And in American Atheists, we do have a plan. And I'm going to show you how, and I, you know what, I say this a lot sometimes and I feel, I feel pompous when I say it. But American Atheists is actually leading this movement and we are going to change this country. And what you're going to see today is a plan for American atheists to lead this movement and change this country and bring this country back not only to where it was before in the golden days of Obama, which seems so long ago, but <laughs> actually moving forward and actually achieving our goal of atheist normalcy, not in the long term, but in the medium term. And you're going to see it happen today. Well, you're going to see you're going to see the plan happening today, but first, before we get into what we're going to do about it, we have to figure out, we have to talk about what actually is happening. When we're talking about the second classing of atheists, if you can hear my voice right now, you're a second class citizen, and that's not a joke, and it's not hyperbole, and it's not exaggeration. You have a second class of citizen. When I first started, in activism back in 1996, there was, a, there was a, uh, a law, a bill in New Jersey called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the RFRA, RIFRA for short. And it was a terrible bill because it shifted the burden, for, uh, the burden of uh, law to the state as opposed to the person. It said basically that religion can supersede civil law. Now, back then, 1996, Victor mentioned that I was the state director. Uh, we fought that bill. We fought that bill. We lobbied the Senate and the House in Trenton, and we won. The bill didn't get passed, but unfortunately, uh, it did pass nationally, and we have it now, and we've had it now for a while, but it's a bad idea and it's getting worse in the Trump administration. What it means is, and let me just, let's just take a, a minute to put religion into perspective if I can. Religion is nothing more than personal opinion. Everybody has their closely held religious beliefs, all those religious people have their closely held religious beliefs, and it's a great euphemism for personal opinion. Those people, <coughs> 
Those people walking down the streets of Paris, shooting innocent civilians, had something very, very important in common with your favorite preacher, with your nice friends down the street of whatever religion they are. They had something very, very important in common with all of them. They were all sure God was on their side. Everybody who agrees, who, who believes in a God, believes in a God that agrees with them. If you are pro-choice, your God is pro-choice. If you're anti-choice, your God is anti-choice. If you like gays, your God likes gays. If you hate gays, your God hates gays. If you like death with dignity, so does your God. If you hate death with dignity, so does your God. Gods are nothing more than a reflection of the person. And it's not about one religion or another. All religions are the same. If you have a God, your God agrees with you. Now that means personal, that means personal convictions, personal religious, strong religious convictions are nothing more than personal opinions that are bolstered by my God agrees with me. That's what religion is. My God agrees with me, therefore my personal opinion has some higher weight. If you want to drive 75 in a 55 zone, that's one thing. But the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says if you want to drive 70 in a 55 zone because your God wants you to drive 70 in a 55 zone, that takes on a different meaning. And your religious convictions have a special place in the law, thanks to the RIFRA. It means that religious law supersedes secular law. It means that if you want to drive 75 in a 55 zone because you want to, you're going to get a ticket. But if you want to drive 75 in a 55 zone because your God wants you to, the state has to prove why you can't in order to enforce it. That's a problem because that elevates religious law above secular law by default. And again, that makes it so that pe two different people, if one is religious and one is not, the religious person can do things that the atheist cannot. That is a second class citizen. And it is a second class based on religious conviction alone. The fact is that if you're religious, you have these advantages. And that means that other people can have convictions that supersede your civil rights. Because you have a civil right, and your civil right is to be equal. Your civil right is to get equal representation from our government. But if somebody's other, somebody else's rights, if somebody else has more rights than you, you don't have that. You don't have that. You have a second class status, and that's what we're seeing. So, I mean, it's a very simple example. Two guys, one beard. Let's say two identical men want to apply for a job at a fire station. The fire station has a no beard policy. The two guys have identical beards. One guy is an atheist. He likes his beard. One guy is, an, is a believer, and his God wants him to have a beard. In this example, the fire station would have to prove that the religious guy can't have a beard. They would very, be very unlikely to be able to do that. And so the religious guy keeps his beard, the atheist goes clean shaven. It's a very simple example for a very big problem. Because, I mean, you're asking me, you're thinking how big. Because in the Trump administration, this started in the Clinton administration. It was supposed to, it was supposed to be a good compromise and it was never going to be a good compromise. But in the Trump administration, RFRA czars, humans, paid federal employees, are being distributed today to the attorney's general offices throughout the states to deal specifically with RIFRA cases, to make sure that those people who want to get special, special privileges, those people who want to get, who want to essentially break the law and believe their God wants them to break the law are getting the best chance of doing it. This is happening on a large scale today. Thanks to the orange 
person in the White House. <laughs> so I'm just going to say something. You know, American Atheist is a 501c3 organization, and that means we're not supposed to politic, but fuck Donald Trump. Yeah. That felt so good to say. I will. <laughs> so that's how you become a second class citizen. When religious folks get an advantage over you regularly, almost by default, you become a second class citizen. But then, Citizens United happened. And that brought RFRA to work. It created corporate religions because corporations are people, folks. Corporations are people, and that means that they have equal rights to you. And equal rights means that their religious rights supersede yours. So now the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the ERIFRA, has been taken to work, and you as an employee are being subjected to the corporation's religious rights. And we saw this with the Hobby Lobby decision. A lot of people are really angry with Hobby Lobby. And it's not Hobby Lobby's fault. Because when you have Citizens United and you have the RFRA, what happened with Hobby Lobby was inevitable. It was the right decision given the law. It was the right decision given the RIFRA. Because corporations are people. And that means that when Obamacare granted a right to every worker in the country, the religious uh, the religious rights of the corporation, of Hobby Lobby, superseded it. And so those Hobby Lobby workers lost that right. Those Hobby Lobby workers lost that right, and if it wasn't Hobby Lobby, it was going to be Walmart or Chick-fil-A. It was going to happen. It was inevitable. And there will be more laws around it. And so what we have now is a second classing of citizens and a second classing of employees. If you work for a religious company, that religious company's religion supersedes, has the ability to supersede your rights. And then the United States would have to prove that it's bad for you to lose those rights. And as we saw in Hobby Lobby, it's almost impossible to do. I think the most insidious attack that we're seeing these days is what we're seeing in the schools, though. Okay? Betsy DeVos is a really bad person, too. She's, uh, I, I can't tell you how much angst and how much anger I feel towards the person who is trying to push school voucher systems on our, on our kids. Now, just to give you an idea of what school vouchers are, the, the school vouchers, the whole concept of the school voucher is that we're going to have competition in the school system, right? That the schools are so full of inefficiency that all we need to do is increase competition in the school system. And ladies and gentlemen, that is bullshit. Okay? And I want you to understand that that line is fundamentally dishonest. Because if they wanted to increase competition in the school system, there's a very easy and clean and fast and immediate and ethical and legal way to do it. And they're called charter schools. Charter schools are public schools that are competitors to the other charter, other local schools, and they take money from the public education system and they give it to the schools, and you can have the you can have your vouchers and you go around. The thing about charter schools, because they're public, they have to accept everybody. Okay? Well, they have to accept most. So here's the point. Religious schools, private schools, they don't have to do any of that, okay? Religious school, private schools are mostly religious, and they don't have to take gay kids. They don't have to take trans kids. They don't have to take Jews. They don't have to take children of color. They don't have to take atheists. So I want you to imagine a pot of money that's too small, that's funding this public school system, and now there's going to take, and they don't have to take the special needs kids, right? And the special needs kids are the most expensive kids. So you've got this cost per kid 
and we're going to take the cheap kids, the smart kids, the white kids, the Christian kids, the straight kids, and they're going to be accepted into this other school system, and the less money is going to go to the public school system, and all the kids left behind are going to have a higher cost per kid and less money per kid. You see that? So you're going to have a choice. The kids are going to have a choice. They can go and apply to these Christian schools, these religious schools, and maybe they'll get in. If they're lucky enough to get in, they'll be indoctrinated into Christianity and taught that gays are bad and all that wonderful stuff that we get from the Christian right these days. Or you can stay in the public school system and have an even worse system than we have right now. Think about that from a big picture perspective, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to have the, public, the private school kids getting a better education than the public school kids simply because of money. And it's insidious. And it's not about discrimination. It's about second-classing students when they're young. It's about making atheist kids, making non-Christian kids less than the other kids and giving them an advantage, We're giving the Christian kids, giving the religious kids an advantage that takes them through the entire rest of their life and brings along with it good old-fashioned, hardline Christian indoctrination. This is what is happening today. And this hurts. We see this happening. We know it's happening. We see all this stuff happening, and this is just the beginning. There's more. We've got religion-based LGBTQ discrimination. All right? We've got In God We Trust being posted on the school walls instead of reducing gun violence, instead of talking about reducing gun violence. We've got the federal judiciary being populated with people who are staunchly opposed to the separation of church and state. We've got FEMA getting money to churches for religious rebuilding. And, and, and. It is a hard time to be an atheist activist. This has affected us, and it's affected our community. <laughs> yeah, Eeyore's, a hard, Eeyore's got a hard life. But it has really affected us. We, have, we are suffering a level of defeatism that I've never seen before, because Obama set us up. Obama made us feel confident. And then Trump shocked us. It shocked all of us. And What's the result of that is that we feel the loss, and we feel like we have lost. We feel like we've lost the election. We see everything that's happening. We see this cascade of attack coming down at us over and over again from all different angles, and we feel like it's over. I have heard it's over so many times. It makes me sick. It makes me sad. It feels like we've lost the apathy that follows it doesn't matter. We can't win anyways. It's useless to fight. This apathy is infecting us and it's hurting us. And then that is reacting and people are reacting to each other now. And so that's causing a division. Lots and lots of division in our movement. Hard, bad division. People are saying it's my way or no way. If you're not 100% with me, you're against me. And that has resulted in a splintering and a factioning, a factioning of the movement that I've never seen before, and neither of us have, none of us have. And it's hard. And so, in other words, we're in a bad situation, and it's getting worse. In other words, I mean, yes, united we stand, divided we fall, and right now we're divided. We are up against an energized foe with unprecedented unchecked power that is attacking us from every angle. And we feel it. And it hurts. And our movement is angry. And our movement is hurt. And our movement is fractured. But we are mighty. We are mighty and we do get back up and we will get back up and we can get back up and here is how we're going to do it. First things we need to do is rebuild our community, start our community, foster a community of togetherness, a community of caring. 
And this is something that I'm very proud that we're doing at American Atheists. American Atheists was forged by Madeline Murray O'Hare, and you know what she did? She cared. Madeline cared a lot. And we do too. Firebrand atheism is and always has been based on love and compassion for our fellow human. Be we are firebrands because we care. I wrote the book Fighting God because I wanted to make sure that people understood that firebrand atheism is about caring. Religion is a lie and a con and a scam. They might not want to hear it, but it is true, and we are doing them a favor when we say it. When we fight religion, when we kill religion, it is a good deed. It is a favor that we're doing for this world. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think, especially outside the movement, especially outside the American atheist community, that we are firebrands because we're dicks, because we're mean, because we like to be mean. But that's not the truth at all. I'm a nice guy. I'm a really fucking nice guy. <laughs> what? I hope to continue building a community at American Atheists that I and we want to be a part of from the bottom up. And that means, among other things, having the backs of our allies, ladies and gentlemen. Having the backs of our allies is a good thing. And the bedrock value the thing that binds us, on which we are building our community, is the care to create an environment where everyone feels safe and equal. Everyone who is not an asshole cares. And you know, we talk about who is an asshole, and you know, I don't like to use these strict words because I don't, I don't want to put down commandments. We don't do that thing, right? We don't dictate morality, but we can talk about our own community. We can say what our community is about. And our community is about caring enough to see that every, caring enough to worry, caring about people feeling safe and equal. And there are lots of atheists who don't care. Too many. And when they get some compassion and they get some empathy, I hope they come back to us. Until then, I'm not missing them. I'm not missing them at all. We all have different lived experiences which are real. And that leads us to different conclusions on how to keep everyone safe and equal. And I hope we can respect the fact that people can and do have very varied lived experiences and that their feelings are valid. Their feelings are important and their experiences are real and important. And we need to build this community around that feeling. We need to build that community around that difference, caring can and should be our great unifier. I talk about the separation of church and state all the time. Why do we care about the separation of church and state? Are we trying to make everybody atheists? No. We're trying to make everybody equal. We're trying to make everybody safe. It's not about dominating. It's about creating an environment in the country where everyone feels safe and equal. We're nice people here. And Putting together, and, and if somebody cares about, some, about keeping everyone feeling safe and equal, I personally consider them an ally. That's what it takes for me. That's what it takes for us, for, for, for somebody to, to be considered an ally by myself. Change and division makes us feel unsafe. I feel very unsafe, in fact, in front of change and division. But differing conclusions does not mean intent to divide. Please, folks, differing conclusions does not mean, by definition, intent to divide. It may, it may be intent to divide, but it may also mean someone with the same values but different experiences. This is a very important point. We all have different experiences. We all, Hugh and I were talking about uh, free will. We all have different experiences. We all have different places. There but for dumb luck go we all. And it, 
So it means as long as we can realize that somebody who might have different experiences cares, they should be counted as an ally. If someone in the movement says someone says something that they don't feel, says they don't feel safe or equal, or they say something disagreeable, I hope we keep listening and determine the intent of the person speaking. We can disagree and be allies in the movement if we all care. That bedrock value of caring is the foundation on which we will build this community, on which American, the American atheist community has always been built. <laughs> and if someone says something, I hope we don't outgroup people just because they challenge or hurt our egos, okay? And this is important. Outgrouping is hurtful. Outgrouping is dangerous to the organization. Sometimes it's necessary. I hope we don't outgroup people just because they challenge or hurt our egos. We have to put our pride aside and care enough to listen to our community members and hear and learn how to show up for each other because we care about them too. If we care about ourselves, we care about this community, we care about the other people in our community that also care. Outgrouping should be reserved for assholes and predators because fuck them. <laughs> Caring, this bedrock community, this bedrock factor will unify the community so people can see past their differences and take their differences in activism and their priorities as long as everyone involved cares. We have a lot of differences between us. We have a lot of differences in this room between us. But we need to unify this community more. And so we need to see past our differences, not only our differences in attitude, but our differences in activism, our differences in priorities, and recognize that caring is the most important part. Caring about creating a community that make, that where everybody feels safe and equal. And then we need to energize this movement by creating a path forward, not just a path for survival, because we're not here to survive. We're here to win. So we need to create that path to victory. And that's what America's Atheist is going to be doing. We need to reset our timelines, for sure. We've taken a kick to the gut. But we need to realize that victory is not only attainable, but if we work hard, inevitable. If we work hard. If we do this right, if we pull together, victory actually is not only attainable, but it is inevitable. And we're going to focus on our biggest assets in order to get there. Atheism still rises, ladies and gentlemen. We are still the fastest growing religious demographic in all 50 states. We are still most of the young people. The evangelical votes, the evangelical right, has ties to Donald Trump, and as such, they have ceded the high morality ground. They have ceded the high morality ground. And guess who sees that? The young. Yeah. The young see that. They talk about it. There were people, at, there were students at Liberty University protesting, the, uh, protesting their relationship with Donald Trump. And they're still there, and that's a first. And they're talking because they have the internet too. The under 30 crowd is what, close to 40% atheist? So the younger atheists, and that means that time is on our side. That means that time is on our side, and time's on the top. And so when we are looking at our future, I hope we can see that we have been pushed down so hard, but it's temporary. It is temporary, ladies and gentlemen. It is temporary if we make it temporary. And here's how we're going to make it more solid. Step one is the ACES program at American Atheist. Now, the ACES program is our program to restart the Atheist Voter Program at the grassroots level. 
it's being run by Jim Helton, right over there. Jim has a very tough job. And his job is to manage the affiliates and the state directors together as, as one unit. Now, what does that mean? It means that these affiliates, we have about 200 affiliates. These affiliates are disparate. They're autonomous. We don't have any authority over them at all, and we don't want it. And we have state directors in many states, soon to be all states, I hope. And these state directors are now going to be uh, charged with getting those affiliates to do any activism at all, as long as it's caring activism. Caring activism. It doesn't have to be atheist activism. It has to be activism for the good of humankind. It has to be activism for a positive force. Activism that supports the bedrock initiative, the bedrock value of caring that everybody feels safe and equal. But that activism has to be under the name of atheism. And that can be really broad. I talked to somebody yesterday who, who asked me, how can I foster atheism on my own? What's the best way to foster a positive sense of atheism? And I told her, wear an atheist shirt and a smile. That's atheist activism. And it doesn't matter what you're doing when you're doing that, as long as you're doing something positive. So this activism, a lot of times, atheist, act atheist organizations, they don't want to be atheist activists. Maybe they want to be pro-choice activists. Maybe they want to be anti-gun activists. Maybe they want to be pro-death with dignity activists. Maybe they want to be LGBTQ activists. Maybe they want to be sex ed activists. We're going to support all of that. American Atheists is going to fund and support activism by affiliates even if it doesn't fall under the A American Atheist Asius. <laughs> There's a secret evil plan here, right? <laughs> right? You all see the secret evil plan. Because those of you who are activists, for, who are, have been activists for a while, already know where I'm going with this, because activism is addicting. And doing good feels great, and it feels it's, it's something that you want to do over and over and over again. Accomplishing something feels great. And so once you start doing that atheist activism, you're going to want to do more. Even if it's not atheist activism, any activism at all feels great. Accomplishing things like that feels great. Getting results feels great. Making the world a better place feels wonderful. I love it. And so we're going to see that happening uh, at the local level, in all 50 states, or hopefully in all 50 states, in the near term. And Jim is working on that now, and we're seeing fantastic results. And Jim is going to be speaking soon. Actually, he's coming on after me. And his daughter is coming on after him, and you're, or, be, or after me. And you're going to hear how this program is working. The other side, part two of this whole thing, is the American Atheist Legal Center. Now. Donald Trump has messed up the federal judiciary a lot, okay? He's messed up the federal judiciary a lot. And if one of the things that we don't want to do at American Atheist, we don't want to file suits and lose and create bad law. We want to do this right. We are in a very dangerous territory. We must tread carefully. And so what we're going to do is bring on a new legal director. We already did bring on our new legal director, Allison. If you haven't met Allison yet, she is the, uh, the, little, the, the tornado that's running around outside. Uh, she is um, a, a powerful activist, a wonderful, powerful activist uh, who is leading our new legal director. And we're focusing now on the grassroots, state-level legal and public policy work. Grassroots, that's the local groups. State-level legal and public policy work. Guess what? There's a lot to do here. There's a lot of room to do good here, and there's a lot of potential to do good here. We have new software and research fellows that will provide a new level of information to the state initiatives, to the ACES program, and give options for activism at the state level. And the options are numerous, 
numerous, especially when they're broad, especially when you're including everything that could be legislation that could fit under the CARES umbrella, the caring umbrella. There's a lot to do at the state level, and we're going to be able to see all of these ample opportunities unfold in front of us. A good example, Washington State has a law that if you're a Christian scientist, talk about second-class citizenship. If you're a Christian scientist and you withhold medical treatment to your child and your child dies or is permanently disfigured or is permanently hurt, you get off scot-free. If you're not a Christian scientist, they call it child abuse, you go to jail. But if it's your closely held religious beliefs, you get off scot-free. And that's happening today. And this was brought to us by our new Vice President, Kim Abel. How about a hand for Kim Abel, who saw her? <laughs> we are fighting this law hard. And we will defeat this law, not only here, but we're going to defeat it in other states with the help of Kim, with the help of Allison, and with the help of all of our state and local affiliates. This is the kind of stuff that we can do today. This is the kind of stuff that we can still accomplish, and Donald Trump can't stop us, which is just wonderful. <laughs> Massachusetts has a new bill that hopefully will be passed into law. It probably won't this year, but maybe soon. And we're going to help it as much as we can that would undo the Hobby Lobby decision because it would stop corporations from being able to declare a religious preference. Yeah. Am I already late? Yes, I am. All right. This is just a taste of how much we have to do. People think that because the federal judiciary is, is so bogged down that we don't have any more judicial, that we don't have any more legal things to do. But we have lots to do. We have lots of fight left in us. And we are going to be doing good where we can while we prepare to make strides to do more good. Again, because we care. Because we want to help people. Because we want to help this world become a better place. The third piece of the revamping of the Atheist Voter Program is the rebuilding and the rising up. Atheist Voter was a success to a point in 2016, but we are to take it to the next level. So we will be promoting atheists at the polls and registering voters while the American Atheist Legal Center and the ACES Program gear up. We will maintain awareness of the Atheist Voter Program. For the 2018 elections, we will have a louder voice and hopefully a larger impact as atheists. And we can and will inject atheism into the conversation. And some of that, some of that will be about the, the ACES program. Some of it will be about the state and local affiliates. But in 2020, we will push from our active affiliates because guess what? Activism is addicting. And we will take those, th these activists that are addicted to activism, at doing good, at being caring, and all these other initiatives that we've got them going on, and we will convert them and organize them into an atheist grassroots voting block for real. We will go into registration, participation, and asking questions of politicians and making political noise on social media, all as atheists by name. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a pendulum swing in 2020. This doesn't happen without repercussions. The future is still damn bright. Not dim, not dark, damn bright. Wear your sunglasses. <laughs> Two to six years, we will see this pendulum swing. We will see religion lose its inferred morality monopoly. And guess what that means? Guess what that means? When religion loses its inferred, inferred morality mo monopoly, we can take that spot. Yes. We can take that spot. We can be the good guys. We can be the people who care. People who care for ourselves, people who care for other people, people who even hate us, we can care for them back. And we can do it not because some God tells us to, but because it's good to do that. It 
two to six years, we will have politicians soliciting our vote because it will be good for them to do that. We will see politicians asking for the atheist vote by name, and maybe sometime soon, there may be a formation of an atheist pack that actually pushes atheism on the, on the candidates and pushes atheist candidates themselves. And in six to ten years, we're not going to see just atheist politicians. We're going to see atheist politicians getting elected. And the reason, the reason that they will be getting elected is because the word atheist will be dramatically destigmatized nationally because we're going to take that high road, because we're going to take that place seated by the, by the religious right. We're going to be the moral center of this country, hopefully. We're going to be the moral leaders. We, atheists, in the name of atheism, in the name of caring, in the name of helping our fellow humans, be they atheist or religious, we will be taking the high road, and we will be getting our new reputation, the new reputation of being good people and good without any gods at all. And in 15 years, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a very, very big difference between the way it is today. 15 years will be a lot better today. Atheism will be substantially normalized in 15 years, ladies and gentlemen. Substantially normalized in 15 years. Yes, really. We're going to see it. It's going to be in our lifetime, and it's not as far away as some of you think it is. I know it feels dark. I know it feels far away. But this is attainable, and it is attainable in the next 15 years that atheism will be substantially normalized. And religion will be down, and atheism is up. Just do a little bit of math, folks. 40% of the under 30 today means 40% of the under 50 in 20 years. 40% of the under 50 in 20 years, and that assumes zero growth, which is not what we're seeing. We're seeing growth everywhere in atheism. We are the fastest growing religious demographic in all 50 states, and if it stops today, we'll have 40% of the under 50 crowd in 20 years. This country is good. This country is getting better, and our movement is still alive. Our movement is still strong and is getting stronger, and we are going to see this movement change this country for the better during our lifetimes, during even my lifetime. It's going to be fantastic. The best way to predict the future is to create the future, and that is what we're doing at American Atheists. Hopefully, you'll, you heard Nick earlier today, Jim and Allison are coming up later on, and we're going to discuss the details for the American Atheist future plans to help people do good and create the future and the caring community that we want. We are going to remember that the heart of firebrand atheism is love and compassion. All religions are lies. All gods are false. Astrology is bullshit, and for Christ's sake, there's no such thing as ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> Those who believe in such things are victims of lies, and it is a good and ethical thing to help free these people from that which is clearly wrong. Religion deserves to die. And, we need to own the fact, we need to own the phrase that killing religion dead without mercy is a good deed. That religion is a painful thing that brings division and hate and poverty and totalitarianism into this world. Religion has done so much damage to this country and this world and most of our families. And killing it dead is humanism. And, doing, and having no mercy is the right thing to do. what you love. Do what you love to do. Do good. Do politics. Do activism. But do it as atheists, my friends. Do it as atheists. Wear that atheist shirt. Wear that atheist button and wear that smile. Pull back those who have left the movement. And it's still a positivity. 
They feel defeated. They feel lost. They feel sad. They feel divided. They feel separated from us. Bring them back. We need all the activists we can get, but their strength will be ours and ours will be theirs, and we can do good together as a team, as a community. Listen for intent. Good people can and do disagree strongly and still be good people. Assholes have bad intentions and they don't care. And I don't care about them. Outgroup on intent, not on position. Makes sense because differing positions are natural in a diverse community. It doesn't make you evil, it just makes you different. Work with and help American atheists to prepare the community, our community, our narrow community, and our broad American community to capitalize on the political pendulum swing of a lifetime in 2020. It's happening, and it's happening in front of our eyes. And while we're talking about it, yes, donate. Yes. Madeline Murray O'Hare, American badass. She cared. She founded this movement because she cared. She founded this organization because she cared. She fought when it was hard to fight. She fought when it was dangerous to fight because she cared. And look at her quote. Her, this is her most famous quote. An atheist believes that a hospital should be built instead of a church. An atheist believes that a deed must be done instead of a prayer said. An atheist wants disease conquered poverty vanished, and war eliminated. There's nothing there that I can disagree with. There's nothing there that we should disagree with. This is our mentality. This is our community. And this slide is dead. All right, so the, the slide screwed up. So, all right, we'll try it one more time. And no, <laughs> no, look, I came out here in the members meeting with a stack of papers, for those of you who are here. I came out with a stack of papers and they were audited results. Our, we are a lean organization of seven employees a bunch of fantastic volunteers. We have a building with no mortgage. We have solar panels on the roof. We are a low cost, highly, highly efficient organization full of activists who work far longer than 40 hours a week for far less pay than we could make elsewhere. And we do it because we care. And we are, and, and I, uh, I have an MBA and I'm very, very interested in numbers and you should all be too. And you should all be interested in transparency. Because yes, we're asking you for money. Yes, we're asking you to donate. And I'm gonna do it proudly. So many times people say, oh, I don't like it when they ask for money. Because that's what religion does. But think about it. If you don't give, if you don't help, you're doing exactly what religion wants you to do. If you're not a joiner, you're wrong to not be a joiner. We need your help. We need your help, we need your funds, we need your money, we need your support. And I'm not asking about this because it's fun. Asking for money is the hardest part of this job. But we have our financials audited every year by an independent accounting firm. And we publish those results on the web so you can all see where your money is going. You can all see how we're spending it. You can all see the efficiency with which we run American Atheists. American Atheists has changed this country a few times since 1963. Madeline did it once. We did it a few times, actually. And we will be changing this country again. It seems like hubris. It seems so prideful when I say that we, seven employees, are going to change this country. But it is the truth, ladies and gentlemen. We, seven employees, a bunch of volunteers, and a whole ton of supporters have the ability to change this country, to fix this country, to dig our heels in now while it's tar hard and prepare for that pendulum swing. And when that pendulum swing, when that momentum is on our side, to pedal downhill so fast 
that we can take this country back and make it better than it ever has been in our lifetimes. It can happen, and it will happen, and it will happen with your support. So I want to thank you for coming to this convention. I want to thank you for hearing me for this long-winded speech. But I want to thank you most of all for your support, for your mental support, and for your donation dollars. Because guess what? This is not going to get done without you. This is not going to get done without all of us. All of us working together, all of us establishing a caring community, all of us establishing a community where we work together for the common good, for each other, for our fellow human, good without any gods at all. I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for donating to American Atheists and enjoy the rest of this goddamn convention.